I don't think I knew any anybody that was not a Latter-day Saint for the first six or seven years of my life. But I distinctly remember moving to Dallas, Texas and attending school and, and becoming almost immediately aware as a young child of a diversity of faith communities um, within my small circle of friends that I developed in that year in first grade. Um, I don't know that I ever contemplated the uh, theological issues at stake of that diversity of faiths. Um, from the time that I was seven, probably up until I was 18 or 19 years old, I just, I was a believing, practicing Latter-day Saint throughout my teenage years and a committed one, um, and one that believed in the truth claims of the LDS Church, um, but not a particularly thoughtful or theologically driven uh, individual. Um, but these issues did come to a head. Uh, I spent two years as a, as a missionary in, uh, in, in Arizona, in the Tempe, Arizona mission, and uh, encountered obviously uh, during my missionary service uh, individuals from a, from a diversity of faiths. Um, and what I discovered that I loved as much as missionary work um, was learning about these other religious traditions. I just became enthralled and fascinated by the history of evangelicalism um, and different interpretations of the Bible and what Mormons as well as evangelicals or Methodists or Presbyterians or Catholics base their interpretations of the Bible on. Um, and so that was kind of my, my, my first entry, I guess, into any sort of interfaith dialogue, any sort of, uh, of that sort of thing. Um, but I still don't know that I, that I ever considered the theological issues at stake there. Um, but I did take some comfort, I guess maybe an earlier manifestation of this or, or something that I hadn't consciously considered, but I've always taken um, comfort in, in the 76th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. It's this great, to me, this, this wonderful and beautiful statement of universalis, universalism um, in the Mormon tradition and recognizing not only that um, essentially all people will be saved, um, but also that, um, that there is truth and that there is beauty and uh, that can be found in all religious traditions. Um, and that's something that, that I've become increasingly aware of as I've continued my study of American religious history as a student. I have a real affinity for uh, high church liturgy. Um, of, of uh, the Catholic or Episcopalian sort, especially. I love uh, the ritual uh, that attends a Catholic Mass. Um, I especially actually love, love attending Catholic Mass in Latin. And I don't know whether because it's so foreign to my experience as Mormon, as a Mormon, that, that, that um, because it's so foreign, it's, it's something so intriguing to me, so, and it, but, but it appeals to me for, for whatever reason, it appeals to me. Um, and I love, um, uh, I wish I could articulate my reasons for, for this love better, um, um, but I really, really just, I enjoy that. And every chance I have to attend um, a Catholic Mass or, or an Episcopalian worship service, um, I take that opportunity to do so for very selfish and personal, I, I just really love that. I feel close to God during those times. Um, secondly, most of my academic research, most of my historical research to this point has focused on actually early American Methodism. Um, so it's appropriate that we're here uh, sitting in the chapel at Wesley Theological Seminary having this conversation. Um, my mother constantly asks me, I think with fear, are you someday going to convert to Methodism from Mormonism? Because I'm constantly talking about um, all of my cool research about Methodists. Um, and there's no secret that I, I, I absolutely love the Methodist tradition. Um, that's not why I started studying Methodism. I started studying them because several of my own ancestors were Methodists who converted to Mormonism, and that intrigued me, and I wanted to know the reasons for um, converting from Methodism to Mormonism in, in the British Isles in the 1830s and the 1840s. 
Um, but as I uh, got into the primary sources, as I began reading um, the diaries of uh, lay Methodist men and women, as I began reading uh, the sermons of Methodist preachers um, in the 18th and 19th centuries, I became touched. Um, and, and this academic research um, coincided with a period of, um, I don't want to call it a crisis of faith um, for me personally, but a period of uh, increased frustration with my own Mormon, with my own Mormon uh, tradition, with, with the Mormon church. Um, and I don't want to get into that too much, if that's okay. Um, other than to say that there were, there were several issues that were troublesome to me, historical issues, theological issues, um, political and social issues that were difficult for me to reconcile. How old were you then? Uh, this is just three or four years ago. So in, in the last three or four, so I was mid-20s, mid 25, yeah. 26 years Got old. Um, uh, I, 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 I'll, I'll mention one. I, I became increasingly... I found it increasingly difficult to reconcile uh, the claims that the Mormon Church made and makes about the historicity of the Book of Mormon with my own academic study of some of these issues. Um, and it became difficult for me to read the Book of Mormon. Um, and this caused, um, or resulted in a period of discomfort when I attended church on Sundays, it, uh, it caused some amount of strain within my marriage um, because my wife, I, I, I wouldn't participate with my wife anymore in, in what had previously been a, a daily scripture study, primarily in the Book of Mormon. Um, and and I've, I've gotten past that. I've worked through those issues. Um, uh, and there's a variety of things that helped me work through those. Um, but one of the things that did, and I think it's uh, probably an unlikely source, is uh, my increasing familiarity with, with Methodist theology. Um, and and what, I, what I considered and what I thought about um, as I was studying these Methodist sermons and these Methodist texts and these Methodist theological statements from, from early on in Methodist history, um, what I considered was how my Methodist ancestors who converted from Methodism to Mormonism would have read the Book of Mormon, how they would have understood it, um, how they would have dealt with, with it um, as a text and as, a, as a, both a historical and a theological text. And what I found was that my assumption was that they, they would have brought certain assumptions that they had, uh, that they had um, inherited or been brought up with in their Methodist tradition to the reading of that text. Um, and they would have, they would have recognized in, in somebody like King Benjamin, uh, somebody that's strikingly similar to the revivalist preachers um, of the Methodist faith in the 18th and 19th century. King Benjamin, in a little context. Where okay, okay, King Benjamin in the Book of Mormon uh, that's discussed in the Book of Messiah um, is, is, a, is a leader of his people and, um, and uh, has a very famous uh, and long and often addressed, um, often quoted address sermon in the Book of Mormon. Um, and the content of that sermon, uh, the way he describes how he offers that sermon where he builds a big platform and gathers everybody and they come in their tents and they face their tents towards him. When I read that, I thought, holy cow, this sounds just like a Methodist camp meeting. Um, and instead of that adding to my frustrations or concerns or doubts about Book of Mormon historicity, I found something very beautiful in this. And I thought, I wonder if my ancestors wouldn't have seen that as, oh, this is evidence of Joseph Smith writing the Book of Mormon and drawing on his cultural surroundings, but finding something that resonated very deeply with their own experience as Methodists um, in their newfound Mormon faith. Um, and that became a very beautiful sentiment to me. That became a very personally meaningful sentiment to me. And it changed the way that I read the text. Um, and I don't know that all of my concerns, I don't know that all of my questions or all of my doubts have been addressed. Um, several of them are lingering in the back of my mind all the time. 
Um, but but for that reason and for for other reasons, I've gotten to the point now where um, where I'm very comfortable reading scripture with my wife again. Where I'm very comfortable um, participating in Sunday school lessons at a Mormon worship service um, on a Sunday when we're discussing the Book of Mormon. Um, and so I recognize that this, this is not something, I'm, I'm not suggesting that anybody else who's having trouble with, with the Book of Mormon um, or who has questions about it turn to John Wesley or Francis Asbury or Adam Clark or any other Methodist uh, preacher or theologian to understand it. But for me personally, um, that resonated. And so I have Wesleyan theology and the Methodist tradition uh, to thank uh, for helping me rediscover or um, strengthen my Mormon faith. Um, and I recognize that may be a very unique uh, situation, but it's one that, that, that worked for me. And it's, and it's really been a, a great experience. So I, have, I guess I have holy envy for, um, for Methodist theology and the impact that I think, uh, I think a very powerful message of grace and a very powerful message of spiritual renewal that was at the heart of John Wesley's preaching um, that has resonated with me and caused spiritual renewal for this Mormon in the 21st century. I am sure that I have several friends um, that find my belief system uh, mildly absurd, who, who believe that um, who see my belief in Mormonism, um, in, in angels and visions and um, healings and uh, that sort of thing as, as ridiculous. Um, particularly several of my friends who are graduate students or academics who um, uh, I guess are more skeptical, um, who are more um, leery of, of religion um, and religious beliefs. Um, I don't think I have any friends who see Mormonism as dangerous um, to America um, or, or to them. Um, and so based on my own experiences, I, I can't imagine having a close friendship with somebody who saw my faith as dangerous. Um, but I can very much uh, conceive of having close friendships with people who find some of my beliefs absolutely absurd. Um, now, I think the key to that is two things. Number one is I hope that my interaction with them, my hopeful, hopefully my demonstration um, that yes, I believe in certain things that they might find, may find silly, um, but that I'm also a thoughtful, uh, critical thinker um, who is willing to engage in open and honest conversation with them about my religious beliefs, about my religious practices, about the value I find in religion, um, about the value I find specifically in my own religious tradition of Mormonism. Um, and I do have that sort of friendship with, with all of the close friends I can think of, um, ranging from, from friends who are uh, openly uh, atheistic or agnostic, uh, to friends who are deeply religious um, in, in both other Christian and non-Christian religious traditions. I don't feel a, a sense of obligation to convert every single person in my circle of friends or in my community. What I do feel an obligation to do is speak honestly and openly about my faith, um, but to speak honestly and openly and respectfully about each of their faith traditions as well. Um, and what I hope I've done is, is as a, as a believing Mormon, as a practicing Mormon, what I hope I've done is uh, through, my, through those friendships that I've been able to build bridges um, 
that will make it so that the next time uh, Mormons who are um, actively member missionaries or full-time missionaries, if two elders or two sisters come and knock on, on one of my friend's doors, um, that they'd be willing to have a, have a conversation to treat this, even if they have absolutely no interest. I, I don't see it as I'm prepping them so that they will someday convert when the missionaries do knock on the door. What I'm hoping I'm doing is I'm preparing them so that when the missionaries do knock on their door or when they move to another community and their next door neighbors are Mormon or their children's friends are LDS, um, that they can um, approach their neighbors or approach their friends or approach the missionaries knocking on their door with some understanding and some knowledge of Mormonism and with a healthy respect for Mormons and Mormonism. So.